call to call to order the meeting for February 7th, 2022. Welcome everybody to the Waterbury Select Board meeting. <coughs> As usual, the first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. Um, everybody's read the agenda. If nobody has any changes or additions. We can move forward with a motion to approve it. I make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Okay. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> Consent agenda items. Minutes from January 24th meeting. Certificate of compliance for town road and bridge standards. Liquor licenses for Kinney Drugs, Maplewood Convenience Store, Woodstock Farmers Market, and the Country Club of Vermont. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Public, uh, this is the time that people who come to the meeting have a, a right to express some concerns or uh, topics that may be weighing on their mind. It's not on the agenda, um, and also welcome to participate in agenda items as well as the meeting pr proceeds. Is there somebody that wishes to speak? Yeah, come on up. And Do you want to go? No, you want to go. Tom, why don't you go first, and then Carly go afterwards. <coughs> Fresh uh, information I want to share uh, with the board. Um, you can just leap through this with me. Uh, the first email here is I sent to Steve Watts speak a year ago, saying there's class two weapons on hold, the area of holes one and two, uh, in Hope Davy, and um, he did not agree with that based on what he had for information. Um, so there's, if you go to page four, this is a fresh analysis as of 127.22. So Chris, you had asked, has A and I been out there? Indeed, they have been out there. And as you can see, there are class two weapons along the uh, dredging uh, ditch that runs under the footbridge, which would be holes 18. Uh, one and two is part of the contiguous wetlands that come off of the blue area. Holes four and five, the wetlands extend up there. And there's wetlands down at holes nine and ten um, as well. And this is from some type of aerial survey that uh, ANR did. The next step that they would do is to do an on the ground um, delineation of wetlands, which this is, this could greatly expand. As I said, there's a contiguous six acres already defined off of the blue area. So that's, that's how this uh, originated. Um, the second thing that I have for you is, if you go to page five, if you look, it's a wetlands permit application for, uh, it's called an after the fact permit and it's for the Smuggler's Notch disc golf course. And if you look in the yellow, you'll see down in the reason for the improvements, it's for a correction of a violation. And this was done in 2018 by uh, a woman named uh, Dory Biden, who I spoke with. And um, if you look at uh, page six, you'll see the changes to the Smuggler's Notch disc golf course based on the findings of the environmental analysis done there. So there's extensive uh, relocating of holes, greens, uh, extensive areas where there's no mowing. This is all class two wetlands. Um, and you can see that anyone can file a violation. We don't know who filed this violation. Someone did. And it's uh, 25 cents a square foot for uh, um, using class two wetlands in ways that they shouldn't be used. And uh, you can see that they paid almost $12,000 uh, 
you know, and fines after the fact, or, you know, however you want to call it. But they also paid for the analysis as well, which um, Dory Barton, who did this analysis, she just completed a similar analysis on 700 acres in uh, Northfield. And she, um, she didn't tell me how much that cost. Smuggler was not to do that. But um, she felt that, and she'd be more than willing to come to one of these meetings or talk to you, Bill, or whatever. But um, she thought that roughly $10,000 would do a fairly comprehensive uh, analysis of the 28 acres just to flush out the, the basic understanding of the type of land that is out there. So, Bill, you've said to me repeatedly that uh, there would be money in the budget for an analysis of that piece of land, you know, towards a management study. And so I was surprised two weeks ago when it came out as included in the package for the, uh, the skate park and whatever else. Um, it's a separate piece of land. Now it's up to the budget, Tom. Excuse me? The, the, money, the money is in the budget. 50000 it's a special article request. That's how the select board decided that they wanted to present it to the voters. Well, it, you, that's fine, but that's, I mean, you presented it to the select board, but you had told me previously that there would be, you could find money in the budget for a study of the area. Okay, well, so, I, it's, the budget is, the budget that gets presented to the, to the town is the select board's budget. This issue has been talked about ad nauseum, Tom. We've been dealing with it for a couple of years now. And there's a presentation, there's people, the rec committee, they had uh, $35,000 earmarked for, for this park to do an analysis of this park to figure out what the conflicts were, to figure out what could be done to take the next step to improve the things that I think you have been talking about for quite some time. There's another group that wants to look at the, the site down at the ice center. So the conversation around this table was, well, maybe for $50,000 we can get an economy at scale and get a consultant in to do this. So I think I held off my part of the bargain. I made the presentation to the select board They've decided to ask the voters to appropriate $50,000. I think we can do what you're talking about for that money. Well, if the voters approve. I understand that, but two weeks ago, your market said at the meeting that, can we do this ourselves? And Nick said, well, we've already completed the analysis. And so I'm just thinking, who completed it? What's the analysis? There has been no study, there's been no analysis, there's been no, no management. That's I, don't, what money I don't believe for. that that's what Nick was saying. He, he said, made the statement we've completed the analysis. I don't think any of us on the select board believe that. Excuse me. Go ahead. I don't believe that any of us on the select board believe that that work that you're talking about has been completed, right? So we're Nick, all expecting that to be part of this work right. that we're putting forth to the voters to vote. Nick, I'm sorry, Mark. Yeah, no, I'm interrupting. Finish and then I'll. Yeah, no, I mean, but that's the whole point is that we recognize it, we believe that it's viable, and then we're asking the voters for that money. And that's why we put it as a special article. Okay, but you're asking the town to vote on it, and nobody knows what the issue is. There's, not, a, there's next, not an open forum next, for we have, discussion. We have, there is. A it's coming up. Yeah, the informational meeting on the 22nd, correct? Yeah. yeah. Is is about these issues that are that will be on the warrant for town meeting. That and anybody, you can either come here, or you can come there. And, and ask these questions uh, to clarify. Um, my suggestion to have somebody from the Agency of Natural Resources come and uh, do an analysis, I won't say for free because we pay the state you know, for their services, but essentially at no additional cost uh, or above what they already provide and, and give us uh, some an idea as to you know what we would be faced with uh, so that we know that going into this project that if an engineer shows up um, we're not getting charged for something that's you know I just had a friend come to me with a with a 
a big set of drawings for the development he's in. He spent $4,000 because he wants to subdivide his piece of property. He spent $4,000 and got nowhere with, the, with this engineer company. And I said, and he threw the questions at me that he was trying to find out. And I said, well, I could have told you how to do this for nothing. Uh, you didn't have to throw away $4,000. So now he's kind of throwing the project into my hands and asking me to kind of hold his hand through part of it anyway. Um, so there's, I'm just saying, I was trying to get the town's tax dollars stretched a bit further by cutting off a lot of unwasted time and effort by, a, you know, hiring an engineer to tell us something that we'll already know if we can get somebody there from the agency and natural resources. Jane, you had a question, comment? Yeah, um, I think that the um, map, I, I looked at it before we came in here, Tom showed it to me, and I think it, the one that just came out on January 27th, I believe that level of mapping is from like existing data from, you know, aerial, aerial maps. And it's part of the LIDAR, isn't it? Yeah, it's all interpreted. Um, but without, I think what you will need is ground truthing that, so to speak. Or it's where you send somebody out and they, they look at the, when the snow melts, they look at the plants, they take soil samples. And I don't know whether you can get that from ANR or not. You may you have can. to go to a consultant. That's okay. all I'm saying. So I think, I just think the public maybe need to parse that out for the public that part of this management plan, as Bill is saying, should have some more detail about the wetlands. So, so I'll, add, I'll add one more we brief, don't know what brief thing. Cost. He okay. has an estimate of $10,000. I don't know if you can get that from ANR or not. Yet. Pertaining to wetlands, and I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, a gentleman had a project designed didn't turn out well for him because he had a tough time with a contractor. My name got thrown in there. He dragged me up there to look at it. I said, well, you're going to have to go to the wetlands people and get this thing expanded. It was a roadway through a, a wetlands. Mm -hmm. I said, because there's no way this is working. Uh, so then I called the engineer who had drawn the design. And he said to me, have this gentleman go to the state, the wetlands division, and ask for yeah. an upgrade on his permit. So, so was he, able he to said, I don't really need to be right. involved in this part. So the state okay. does offer those okay. services to an extent. Yeah, sometimes they have to hire consultants to do that, work, based on my experience on the OTP trains. OK. Um, anyway, that's what I chime My, my <laughs> understanding that the process is either they can be asked by the landowner, i.e., to the town, to do a delineation, or there can be a violation which forces a delineation. I think we, un we all understand, and we've understood for a long time, Tom, based on the information you brought here, that you brought to me, that you brought to the rec committee, that there's wetlands. We, nobody's arguing that. You said it two weeks ago for the first time. Nobody's arguing that. I said it. I walked out there publicly, with Publicly, I know that. But publicly, it's the first time that this group has heard the word what associated difference does it with make? the land. That's because that's, you can't that's, vote, that's that's you can't that's vote on something if you don't understand true. it. I know. I've been in this position so before, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, I think it's We've a good point before, because Mark. we have an informational meeting on the 22nd that allows the public to, you know, be involved and understand this to a, a larger extent. Right. But okay. when and I think when that Nick was when Mitch was this. talking, he was not saying that anybody had done an analysis. What he was talking about was the rec committee had reviewed and gone over the, the information that Frank Spaulding had brought back with his experience from the state, and they said, this is kind of what we're looking for. That was presented to the select board. We talked here about that was pretty broad brush stuff, that we would need more information than that. So there's $50,000. If we can't get this done for $50,000, Tom, there's something wrong. So no, I'm not sure what you're saying. But there's a lot of demand on it, number one. And number two, people have to vote for it. Right. It could just fall flat. Well, that's what the process is. I understand that, though. But there's a disc golf course. There was never a vote on a disc golf course, right? You have a skate group that wants a piece of town land. Why don't you give them 10 acres, right? Just give it. Say, do what you want with it. 
Tom, that's essentially we can't what put we the have. toothpaste back in the tube. I know. All I know. of your issues that go back decades, we can't change anything. All yeah. we can do is go forward, Tom. Right? I understand. I understand. You can do it right, or you can do it wrong, and revisit it. So that's really up to the. That's up to the select board. Well, I what think the committee is going to stay in touch with the select board, and obviously they're supposed to. You were at the last one, right? The last rec meeting. Yeah. Uh, isn't the last one? But, yeah. Isn't the, one our understanding that they're going to? Well, there's two components. There's the there's the the agreement between the disc golf group and conversation surrounding that use agreement. But then there's a completely separate conversation surrounding the planning for that area to continue to work towards a multi-use disc golf hiking. Etc. That that's the conversation that I believe is being voted on for funds right. is is getting money together to make a more master plan for that area, as far as I understand, right. and, and all the work associated with it, which would include this work. Well, and I think probably at that point, rather than expediting part of that plan, they should probably come in front of the board. Let, and I think they probably will, yeah, right? Think, Let yeah, us know what they've got. I don't think the select board would not be have full visibility to the decisions surrounding yeah. how that money's being spent. So that we can you know, yeah. direct them in, a, in perhaps a better direction if, if for some reason they're jumping the gun on something and you know, we can get some of this, these free services to, <clears throat> to eliminate some of those costs. And all right, but to again, spend someone money. has to make the ask. Yeah. And I think they're under the understanding that they need to come to us. So the next part of the process, I think, Tom, and I know that this is something that you want to have happen tomorrow. I expect the select board will wait until the voters make a decision on March 1st about whether they were going to appropriate the $50,000 or not. If they do, then I think we'll go forward in a particular direction. If they don't, then the issue is right back here again, and they'll have to decide what the next step is. And I don't think the select board will be prepared to just let something that that's that this that is this difficult and delicate to just lie. I think we'll end up having to do something with it. So. Well, you know, you say ad nauseum, Bill. It's like this is fresh. You haven't seen this. No one here has seen this. Okay, this is new information, and it's relevant. As is the smugs information. This is relevant. Okay, it's real. It was. Okay. Um, so, can I ask a question? I'm very confused as this Vermont Wetlands Program permit application. To me, this doesn't. This looks like something that smugglers did. No, this doesn't have to do with. Look, it company. says right on it. It says correction of violation. So they had an existing course, and due to being in violation of the use of the wetlands, they had to go through the permit process. But this is not for our disc golf course. No, he was bringing that okay, as an I'm example just, of what not to This is, <laughs> what I'm saying this is, is what could happen. do things in a class two you wetlands, know. this is what you're I'm looking at. I'm just making sure. This is the corrective measure you're going to be looking at. Okay? Yeah. I was just supposed to say one thing. In looking at this map, I was, I think you should take a close look at the very corner of the map, which is where Thatcher Brook is, along that uh, property line. And I just saw this right this in the meeting. But it shows that that blue area that's partially obscured by the label there is a is a uh, wetland where the whole mine is. So something to keep in mind. Yeah, we I don't think the select board would allow the whole mine parallels essentially. Would allow violations to take place and you know if we have anything to say about it. We'll, we'll, we'll operate through the proper channels and to it that it gets done the way it's supposed to get done. Right. So yeah, you really can't make an informed decision unless you're informed, you know? Yeah. You can go with public opinion, but that's not an informed decision. Yeah. We understand that, and if yeah. some parts of the disc golf course needs to be relocated to work with the wetlands, that's what we may have to do, and that's all part of this master plan. Yeah. Well, I, I hope the master plan happens. I hope the voters don't vote it down, but, you know, if. They have to be informed. It's the first I've heard of this information meeting. I'll be there, you know, so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Hopefully people pay attention to it. Yeah. Well, that's, that's their choice, Tom. I understand. It's, I understand. You know, it's pick hope, and choose. We hope for an, elect, for an informed electorate. Yeah. Is uh, it half the people vote roughly or less? So it is what it is.
Anyway. And even less than that, I would probably attend the meeting. So yeah, I'm sure. It's yeah, right. it'll just be, talking. It'll be spotty. We're just talking right. about that today. So we have Lisa on the line, so maybe she'll take interest in some of it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank I appreciate you, it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question related to host Jane Brown. Um, I'm on the recreation committee. Um, we, the recreation committee, had. Um, come up with an interim draft agreement for Hope Davy Park um, at our January meeting in the middle of January. And I wondered what the status of that was in terms of the select board. Because I abstained from voting for it for a couple of reasons. And I sent an email to Mark and to Bill um, and Nick, but I didn't uh, copy anybody else. And I just had a couple issues of concern about um, that I mentioned in my email. I was concerned that the group of disc golfers are not like an organized group, but they have abilities to collect donations, and there's no, there's no, what, there's no means for accountability for what so that money is. Formal organization. In terms of a disc agent, or, and, and it seems like we've been going along here, you know, with league play and all this other stuff, and we just need to be really, um, it just, that just doesn't make sense to me. And it was disappointing that they wouldn't step up and form a group similar to what WADA has with the Putnam State Forest for their bike, um, their whole thing for Putnam State Forest for their bike group, which is a very different level of group. WADA has a very organized group with an executive board and director and everything. So I don't know why they just golf after a year and a half of meeting with them and having assembled that way. So, um, and I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, this is, has nothing to do with personalities or people or anything. It just doesn't make sense as a town that you would have um, nobody responsible when they're collecting money. There's a way to um, account for that money, where it's going, donations, and um, in terms of management. And the other thing was something that was in there was about um, uh, liability. Um, that basically, the town would be held harmless for activities of the volunteers and work that was done by volunteers. So that, that didn't make sense to me either from a legal standpoint because the town has insurance for um, from Vermont League of Cities and Towns for its our plans. So there's something is to happen there. You're covered by that insurance. But in this case, because you have volunteers doing the work, um, they are deemed, if something were to happen to a private citizen because of some fault of the volunteers, there's no, it's not covered by insurance for the town, even though it's on town land. The way it's stated, it sounds like you have to sue a private citizen if something happened to you. Yeah, that, I think there's been conversation about how that could be structured. I think it was all well. going to, the question was going to be legally how could this agreement actually be a legal document and like, there was a question mark, but I think there's the there's the bulk of the agreement and, and, and the hope that there's an entity that can be legally defined in that agreement. That's a conversation for the town's legal counsel and trying to figure out if right. it can't be, say, say it can't be as informal as center chains with they turn in a volunteer list every year, whatever that conversation is. If that can't be it, then you look to groups like RW or whoever else that maybe could have it fall under if they wanted to, you know, whatever. There's a lot of work right. that still has to be completed. Yes. I don't think there was any belief in that meeting that I was in that that was the finalized document forever. That's just the document that would be brought to the select board. I think there's plenty of work that's going to be remaining including questions surrounding if they do receive funds, how those funds are managed. That was something okay. I brought up in the meeting All while right. I was there. So like, I think, to think that the select board is part of the woods, that also came in during budget season, so we're busy putting I budgets know. together. I don't think, I think that work is is important, but it's it wasn't gonna be brought into the select board through budget season, because that okay. there's a lot of conversation in that document. Some of which that could probably not happen within a, the board meeting, a couple select board members can review the document together, work with Bill, 
so it's figure like, it out with the lawyer to find out what yeah. the legality is surrounding everything that was written because it wasn't written by a lawyer, and then decide on question marks surrounding the like the lawyer might red strike. Right. The, okay. You know. So there's. I don't think. So I don't think that, any of us thought that it was just going to show up to our our meeting. We were going to sign off. Well, on. I didn't know what the timing was. So yeah. I was just asking. I don't that. think there is a specific timing on that. I think the hope is that we get it in place. It would be great. I think if it got into place before spring. Well, we have some time. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of work between now and spring to get that completed. Sure. But I think efforts could be made. You know, we're waiting on the committee to make the first move, I guess. Well, they did. They no, passed we did. it forward. We, yeah. we sent you a draft, yeah. but two of us abstained from it because we had some issues with some of the things. And as much as we'd like to get an agreement made, it's just. So, you, I mean, the town has legal counsel, so you have to. All right. Well, next time, Jay, maybe you should vote no instead of abstaining. Abstaining kind of means you have no opinion. I think you're right. And in hindsight, that's what I feel. <laughs> and I guess that's part, part of why I think it's not. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Carl. Come on up. I went in and spoke with Bill. Oh, goodness. When was that? Monday? Friday. Friday. Uh, the parking lot in between. Bottom Clouds Building and the Stowe Auto, or the Waterbury Auto. 51 it's 51 South Main. Main. Uh, the parking lot there yeah, has the turned building. into a little bit of an issue. Mm -hmm. You have uh, some homeless people living there. And when it's zero degrees out, there's a couple challenges. One is you've got this gentleman who's uh, throwing his bodily fluids out into the parking lot while he lives in the car. I know that mental illness is an issue globally. I know that homeless, uh, the housing issue is a global issue also. Uh, Bill is, I know, been working on it, and thank you. And uh, I know Mr. Woodruff is also trying to address the situation. But you've got a, uh, you've got a bus down there that people live in periodically. You've got a, a pickup truck. Bill, maybe you know different, but. It's uh, as far as I know, at, at no nine o'clock at night when you see them sitting in there watching television on a Wednesday night. It's uh, maybe it's their TV room, but at the same token, you have another gentleman who's living in his car, unfortunately, and, and the issue's got to be addressed because you've got people trying to conduct business on either side, and you've got patrons walking by watching what's going on out there. And I know it's a, I know it's a challenging question but it's got to be addressed. Uh, Bill, you mentioned that you uh, had the state police there doing a well check, and some of the autos, uh, and even some of the trailers there, aren't registered. Is there a protocol that the town's established for vehicles being left and living? Well, I mean, I'm you're, not, gi you're giving KOA a bad name. So, uh, no, I'm not aware. Uh, we have an ordinance that allows if vehicles are unregistered, they can't be left in municipal parking lots or in, uh, on, on town streets. Um, I haven't gone and inspect all those. My conversation with Bill Woodruff, I believe the pickup truck that the gentleman in question is the only one that's not registered. We allow those, we allow 51 Main Street, 51 South Main Street to be used as a place where people can park their vehicles who don't have other off-street options. We've got a parking van, can't park on Union Street or any other street in the village. Most of the parking lots, uh, the Elm Street parking lot, parking lots up on Bidwell Lane, all of those um, are places that we tow cars from. When 51, which wasn't a parking lot until a few years ago uh, after the flood, uh, We've allowed that parking lot to be used as a place where people can put cars uh, that don't have other uh, places to park. Uh, there, you know, we used to have an issue with WDV. There had an overnight person there, or people that would come in early in the morning, they'd park out on Snow Street, they'd get towed. So we told them, park at 51 South Main Street, we won't touch it. So I believe, um, or I've been led to believe, I should say, that the, the
the pickup truck in question is the only one that's not registered. I don't know that for sure, but that's what Understood. Bill, Bill Woodruff told me. The, the issue is not we, leaving a vehicle on site. We, we have someone who is unfortunately, no, you, you unfortunately asked, living in their car. You asked about who is taking a urine bottle and pouring it out the window, and it was defecating outside the door. And I'll be more than happy to forward your pictures of what's going on there, I'm, I'm which just is which to is the which is that which you is asked. atrocious. I'm sorry, Bill. Yeah, you know, I'm just trying to answer the question you asked, which was the protocol about vehicles. And I'm trying to, maybe I'm too detailed, but I'm trying to get there. Detail's good. All right. So I talked to Bill Woodruff. This pickup truck in question, we called to tow it out of there. When the tow truck arrived, the guy's in the car. The tow truck won't tow a vehicle that somebody's in. So, you know, we played this cat and mouse game. Uh, I talked to Bill today about this, um, uh, and I told you the other day, Carl, that, um, that the gentleman had indicated that he was going to be moving along. Um, we didn't tow the vehicle today, but when I went by, there was nobody in the vehicle. So I, I understand the issue. I talked to uh, the woman who ran the business on Friday. She came down after you did. Um, it's not that I'm not concerned, uh, but I'm not smart enough to fix this problem right now. Uh, before I came down here, I watched the news, you know, Burlington is getting ready to try to spend $3 million to address the homeless issue. In Barrie, they're talking about how they're dealing with their homeless. Uh, the issue is everywhere. Uh, we have a couple people, and I'm not suggesting that that bodily fluids or anything else is okay. It shouldn't happen. Uh, but I can't arrest the guy. Uh, and the state police, they've talked to him. They've tried to uh, make available to him uh, the knowledge about where he could receive services. You can't make somebody accept those services. So um, I'm not saying that we're ignoring it. I sent, you know, Bill Woodruff goes down there several times a week to try to deal with the issue. Um, if anybody's got a suggestion, I'm happy to hear about it. I don't know if we have an ordinance that prevents public defecation or urination, but even if we did, I'm not sure how I'm going to enforce it. So um, it's a situation that you know, I understand why people are concerned and upset. Come I'm, just, I'm just being honest with you that I don't have a solution right now. So can I ask the first question is, uh, that is still the property of EFUD, correct? So how does that fall under the jurisdiction of a municipality? Does it? Well, EFUD's a municipality, so. Um, just not, it doesn't fall under the town. You know, it's, right. it's, I it's their that. property. I just wondered and, uh, what avenues. And I, I explained to Carl the other day that, you know, I had this conversation with Skip Flanders, who's the chairperson of the EFUD board. I talked to Skip uh, last week or so about it. Um, and I didn't want to tell Carl that coming here wasn't a good thing. You should know about the issue. You should know Absolutely. about the concern. But the property isn't owned by the town of Wadri, it's owned by EFUD. I happen to work for both municipalities, so talking to me is fine. Uh, I hope I didn't waste your time by telling you not to come here tonight, because no, as no. I said, I, you told me that you you wanted to come, and I, I think it's an issue that we all should do. So is it, is does EFUD have the legal authority to post no overnight parking uh, in that facility? Uh, and could we, could there be some enforcement on that, through that avenue if that were the case? I well, mean, I don't know. <clears throat> Certainly they could they could decide to say that they're not going to allow cars to park in there uh, overnight. Then that shifts the problem for other people who are just looking for a place to put their vehicles because they can't leave them on the street, right? So that there's a, there's a different problem that comes up. And if you pass a rule, I mean, an ordinance takes 60 days before it's effective. So you gotta 
factor that in. But even if you could adopt a rule right now and say no camping in, in that lot, if it was effective tomorrow, I'm still not sure what I can do to get the guy out of there. I'm not going to go down there and point a gun at him and tell him he's got to leave. No. So my bigger concern is if, if something like that isn't enacted, eventually it will be completely commandeered by homeless and nobody will want to park there anyway. So in my opinion, if, if we can take an approach like that, or if EFUD can take an approach like that, that may put an end to this problem to some degree. Uh, you know, you, you got to come up with something. And uh, right now, what's work, what's there isn't uh, is that's all the and, problem. And I, as I told Carl, just so you folks know, I haven't taken this lightly. I've communicated, I've talked to uh, the, the municipal attorney, uh, Joe McLean, last week about this. He's the attorney for both the town and EFUD, so either one. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a challenge. It's not something that you can, if it was an easy problem, Carl wouldn't be here because it would have been taken care of. Yeah. Right? No, I'm sure you're doing the best, Bill. Nobody's questioning. No, no, I, I know. I don't feel, um, I don't you know, feel from a mental, mental, right. mental, just, mentally handicapped perspective, um, whoever is, is over there is smart enough to know that they need to be in their vehicle before it gets towed, so they won't be towed. So, you know, I kind of question that issue uh, to a degree, but uh, I, I would like to just stress, Bill has done, he's been very cooperative, uh, very cooperative and listened sure. to my, my plea here, and, and I, I want to make sure everyone's well aware of that. Um, he, he, this one's a tough one. Can I, can I Did Skip give you any indication? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I would highly recommend contacting two sources, both Downstreet Housing and Washington County Mental Health. I'm sure they have, both of them, a ton of experience with dealing with homeless people and how to intervene a lot better than we all may, may be able to. You, you know, it, it, it's a tough issue. You know, I saw that thing on the Burlington, you know, they wanted to build it. I called it like little ice shanties almost. For, right the house and I, I don't know how good that's of an idea that is, but I don't know if this is going to be, I think this is maybe an outlier versus something that we're going to have a whole homeless camp. Maybe I'm wrong, but you know, I just, I just look at, I think we need to deal with it on a case by case basis and hopefully it's not going to become a more pervasive. I mean, I can try to get down street or or Washington County Mental Health, I believe those are sources that the state police talk to him about. So right, I, I don't know if they have. make somebody go. Right, it's a tough issue with homeless. And once again, come the spring melt, there's gonna be a disgusting mess over there. Yeah. And, and hopefully this is somewhat resolved prior well, to, I, to us getting know, into that situation. I, I, I've thought about putting a porta potty out there, but that that's kind of invites people. <laughs> yeah, that just says, come stay here. Can I ask you a question specific to that? So, like, say you had a house, and I decided I was going to just start using my yard as the bathroom. There's nothing that says that, there's nothing within town ordinance that says that you can't do that? Not that I'm aware of. I mean, I, At town what ordinances are typically not written cover every sure. situation. So I don't know that that's a more of a health, that health, health issue. Says that. You know, this, this like will you arise into a health issue sooner or later, or later if it's not addressed. Yep. And, and um, well, you know you can't let sewer run down the ditch line from your septic system. So uh, yeah. I believe there's got to be some type of requirement for septic treatment. Ann's got a question. Yep, go ahead, Ann. You got to unmute yourself or we got to do it. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I see him come and go because my living room window looks directly across at him at that pickup. And he comes and goes. And I know the state police have been aware of it since August at, or even earlier. 
because I'd spoken to them and I know they've gone over. It's been ongoing and I know everybody's been trying to do all they can, but there are, you know, limitations. And I saw the tow truck over there the other day and he was walking around the tow truck and just standing by his uh, truck and the tow truck left because they can't take it if he's going to be there. But the plates, the plates, the registration was June, expired in June. So it's a, you know, I don't know what we can do. You know, well, other that's why than- I think you keep posting some type of uh, restricted guidelines for overnight parking or something might be a first first course of action. Uh, I mean, no. Like, so said that there's a whole other issue with people who don't have places to park their cars, you know, just looking to get their car off, you know, the street to avoid getting like I said, ticketing people. That's a whole other issue. You've got to I have seen him change his there. clothes out there. Yeah, he wraps a, himself in a blanket and changes his clothes. He is doing this in front of a business, and you have someone who is trying to run a business. I know. Who has, the, who has their patrons watching this excavation. Yeah. It, it, this is. Well, I think at this point, we, we, we all understand that it's an issue, and we need to try to somehow deal with it. And the uh, first course of action is to get a hold of Skip and. and EFUD and maybe either have a joint meeting or maybe you can approach him again and consider the options. Yeah, we're not we're like giving up on it. Yeah, yeah. just, yeah. you know. Still, I appreciate your efforts. No, I, 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 I do. No, no problem. I wish I yeah, could. It's something we have to feel yeah, your pain. Be careful. It's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a difficult situation. It's, it's a very it's, uh, we, we feel for all of it. Yeah. It's, uh, it, <clears> the <throat> empathy is there. Okay. Thanks, Thank you, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Thank you for letting me know. You got it, buddy. Hey. Linda here. Hi. Yeah. Um, are we on Black Board A? Yeah. Hi, Linda. Hello. Hi. I'm a Black Board member. What's that? Is it my turn up? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I'd like to bring an opportunity, uh, I should do this opportunity, uh, to the select board. Go ahead. Hang on. You, you, well, yeah, I'm going to pull up my notes. You have the floor. The Vermont Community Broadband uh, is offering matching funds for any funds that we commit during uh, 2022 toward broadband through the TV fiber. The, 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 board, the VPDD board will match con- contributions of state fiscal recovery funds allocated on a first come first served basis up to a total of $13 million for the whole state. And TV fiber share is one and a half million dollars approximately. The total amount that a single communication uh, union district or town, not a member of the communication, will receive from the pool of money is equal to the percentage allowed under underserved and underserved road miles formula detailed in Act 71. The funding will be distributed on a first come first served basis and the deadline for submitting a, a letter of commitment is September 2022. Uh, all the details are, are sent in a handout um, on the updated F71. And you should have received that. Um, a letter of commitment must be included in the grant application from the municipality providing the matching funds. And the letter must be submitted uh, and to the CUD, which is TV Fiber. So 
I am here today to try to put together a process to see if you folks are interested in matching funds for any contributions you can make in 2022. Linda, the, the 1.5 million, that's the total budget that CV Fibers put together for their work in this area, or is it just Waterbury, or what is that $1.5 million number? That's, that's the uh, amount of money that CV Fibers uh, can ask the Vermont Community uh, Broadband Board for, for the, all the 21 towns in our district, in our membership. So I brought a, a, a possible a number that you might be interested in. So let me bring that up next. A waterway has 72 miles of road to cover with fiber. This does not include driveways. The cost of the construction for installing this fiber is about $3 million. Paying the construction costs come from two sources, grants or subscriber rates of service. Grant funds provided uh, by Waterbury to CB Fiber will lower Waterbury's subscriber rates. Whatever amount each town agrees to pay towards the broadband in their letter of commitment, the VCDB will match on a first come, first serve basis. Deadline, September 22. There are 21 towns vying for the funds that have been allocated to CV Fiber's share of 1.5 million. So whatever amount uh, Waterbury commits to will be matched if Waterbury commits early enough to secure the funds. Funds that Waterbury commits plus the matching funds are used for Broadway construction in Waterbury. If Waterbury, I'm going to give an example. If Waterbury could contribute $125,000, along with the funds that are matched by CBDB, that would total $250,000 to get started on installation on the 209 premises with 25 street speeds or less. We have approximately 121 underserved premises and 88 premises which are low service speeds. So what I would like to do is try to find a process to see if the, the select board would be interested in going for some matching funds, because I think it would help the residents of Waterbury. Thanks, Linda. I think because I'm on that 209 person list, I should probably recuse myself from discussions surrounding funds towards that, but I will hand it over to Chris and we will continue. So Linda, just, just the project to serve the residents of Waterbury is a three, minute, $3 million total project to, to complete? Yes, because we have it, it's a construction of 72 miles of fiber. And if uh, if we if we if we proposed a hundred thousand dollars, you're saying that the match would be equal. First come, first That's right. serve. What's that? First come, first serve. So how does the other two point eight million dollars get paid for as as the process continues? Great. There's only two ways to pay for it, and that is. Basically, ARPA funds, grants, or we charge people who are subscribers when they get on. So, Bill, is that the ARPA funds that we currently have, or is there additional ARPA out there? I think they're the ones we currently have. Well, altogether, we're going to get $1.5 million of ARPA funds. Right. We've included in this budget uh, that will go to town meeting, $700,000 of ARPA money, 600 for EFUD for the water, and $100,000 for the hype center. So there'd be 
800,000 left. I, we've used some additional money in our budget this year, um, but I pared that down based on the last meeting, so the, I can't remember exactly how much ARPA money is going into the existing budget, but it was less than uh, it had been a couple weeks ago before the budget was finalized. And what I would tell the board is that I was going to have this conversation after town meeting and with the new board, but I can say it now. My expectation or my goal would be, you know, the ARPA money that we have used to support our budget, so to speak, not these special articles, <coughs> that we would wait until the end of the year, and if we didn't need to transfer that money to, you know, if we had higher revenues and lower costs than we had elsewhere, just like we did with tax stabilization fund last year, we wouldn't have to spend the ARPA money. You understand what I'm saying? I do. So, um, Linda called and talked to me on Friday, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the process by which she's wanting to um, identify right now is how does the select board choose to spend any more ARPA money if you want to on this or any other thing. And, uh, you know, we just finished the budget process. Unfortunately, uh, this information didn't come to us during budget time, which would have been a whole lot easier because it could have been in the uh, discussed. Um, I don't know for certain. My belief is that the way the uh, federal legislation is written is that the select board has the authority to make decisions on how to appropriate ARPA funds, but that's a pretty radical departure from how the select board usually wants to deal with the expenditure of public funds, which is to have a, a town vote. So I explained to Linda that there's no way to put anything on the budget at town meeting uh, to address this issue. Unfortunately, it's 2022 and we're in COVID and we voted to have a Australian ballot meeting because you could have dealt with this issue from the floor if we were having an open town meeting. We could have made a motion to appropriate additional funding. So um, the challenge is not only to identify how much money you want to spend, what the source of the money is that you want to spend, but if you're going to go through the process of letting the town voters have a say, then it's going to require another town meeting. And, you know, uh, so you'd have to warn a special town meeting just for this particular issue. Um, if you want, I can find out and be certain about, you know, uh, whether the select board on its own motion could appropriate money for this uh, with the ARPA funds, if that's something that this select board or the next select board wants to do, that's, that's your choice. I, I don't know for certain it's a, a choice that you can make, but I've heard through the grapevine, so to speak, as I've gain more information about ARPA that the select board uh, as the legislative body of the community can make decisions, but I, I don't know that for certain. So I'm just going to do the math here on uh, Mark had a question. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Uh, Linda, I guess one of my questions would be, you know, I think at one point it was presented to the select board like a user fee of $65. You know, do you believe that without the funds of the town, this project wouldn't get funded, or would be, is there a change in the speed of which this project would roll out based on, say, if the town were to pay $100,000? I guess that's what I'm trying to understand the reality of this project in general, but what are your thoughts on, you know, I don't, does $100,000 really change users' fees that much? You know, there are plenty of other ways that money could be spent via the town. Can you kind of explain to the board what would potentially happen if those funds, obviously matched money is always nice to have, but it requires matched money. So it's, I guess that would be my question. And I'm a user, but $65 sounds cheap, so. <laughs> well, the, the, uh, the assumption of the 
$5, as far as I remember, is that um, it is under assumption that the towns will be contributing their grant, some of their grant money toward um, their town fiber installation. Any it's idea? Like any idea how much, Linda? I hate, to, I hate to interrupt you, but any idea how much that of town money that would require to get it to that uh, price, that price tag, price point? I, I, they have not set a price tag on it um, because they don't know how much the towns are contributing yet. So it's, it's kind of a vicious circle here. You can reduce the subscriber rate by making contributions, but they, don't, they won't know that until they realize how much the contributions are going to come in. So just doing some quick math, you said there's what, 72 miles? Yes. Yes. Into 3 million, that's 40, almost 42,000 a mile. Um, if you were to allow the subscribers to pay the bill on that, that's a, a difficult problem in itself because until the project's built out, you won't get the full subscription uh, payout. Um, so we will have to take a bond. Steve Ritter would have to take a bond to get the construction finished. And as soon as the uh, construction is finished, the bond will have to be paid off by the subscribers. So to Mark's point, the town select board, I guess, would have to be tasked with the uh, with the uh, problem of figuring out where the money, ARPA money, is better used, I guess, at this point. Um, uh, and that's, Christopher, you know, Mark, my, the alternate delegate is here also, and I think he would like to chime in, if okay. you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Jump in, Chris. Hi. Yeah, good evening. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, we could probably, you know, drill down and, and figure out the actual subscriber amount, you know, if, if we did some real, real hard math, but uh, that's obviously challenging, challenging you know, like Linda said, we, we don't know how much people are going to, or towns are going to be giving. Uh, the, the bottom line is, obviously, if, if, uh, if towns don't contribute, uh, you know, then the match, the BCBB match won't be there, and so that's, that's going to represent an increase in cost that has to be passed on to subscribers. Um, so the, the bottom line is here is the more that Waterbury can give, uh, and the earlier Waterbury can commit to giving that money, the more likely it will be that those, the, those dollars given will be effectively doubled, um, and, and we'll reduce the rates. Now, if, if I had to, you know, sort of guess based on, on the information that we have, if, if Waterbury didn't give anything, we wouldn't be able to hit anywhere close to that $65 per month uh, rate. It would probably be in the hundred or, or, or more uh, per, per month, which isn't terribly worse than consolidated in my opinion. But anyway, I'm also in one of the underserved, so I, I'm certainly biased. But, um, Whereas if, if we were able to, you know, theoretically commit to that full $3 million, you know, we could probably be well under, you know, $50 per month um, for that same service. So, you know, those are, those are estimates, uh, but in order to get to hit that target, you know, $60, $65 per month rate or, or even lower, we, we really have to have, have uh, funding elsewhere. And, and also we have to, you know, um, we have to have a certain number of subscribers. If we have three people sign up for our service, then we're not going to be able to maintain those those lower rates. Um, but what is clear is is TV Fiber uh, is dedicated to um, to passing any and all savings on to the subscriber. That's that's kind of the whole point, you know. Besides the fact of, of serving the unserved or underserved is is uh, you know is not making a profit is, is passing any savings we can on onto the, the users and for, you know, for Waterbury residents, uh, whether they're, you know, underserved or not, um, you know, that's just a really high quality service for a low cost, so, and, and an option other than Comcast. Right. 
So doing the doing the math again on the on the 2.8 million into the 72 miles, it brings it down to 38,000 a mile. That's four thousand dollars less per mile. I don't. That's not a huge windfall. You'd almost have to have uh, an infusion of that type of match every year till the project's built out in order to make any substantial headway on on lowering the cost. Uh, and then, the, like you just mentioned, the, the su subscriber uh, uh, buy-in to this thing is, is critical. Uh, and is there any information on how you will move forward with, with that? Uh, I'm wondering, you know, I'm trying to think outside the box here. Uh, how many subscribers would it take to, or how many subscribers are you looking to reach, I guess? Do you have a number on that? With Joe to the point. Well, the goal, okay. yeah, I mean, the, the goal initially is, you know, the, the first goal is serving the, the unserved and underserved. That's the, the, you know, the initial goal. Yeah, I didn't know if there was uh, a then number. And you're building out to be, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so in water, we, have that, water we have 209 right. that we're top targeting at the moment. So let me, can I ask a different question? Um, because Chris just kind of indicated, Chris Chank just indicated that, you know, maybe others would, would subscribe. So there's, you need to build 72 miles worth of fiber to serve the underserved and the, the non-served right now. But uh, how are the people who are already served, how can they benefit from this? Are, are, is there going to be CD fiber that's going in all the places that is already served, or are you going to splice into Comcast? I mean, how, how, how is this going to benefit people that already have broadband capacity? The way I understand it is okay. as the construction goes along the road, that if people have signed up for, you know, subscriber, they will be connected immediately. We are targeting the underserved, yes. but others will be allowed to get on the service. Yeah, so I think Bill's, I think Bill's question is, can you, go ahead, Chris. If I if I uh, if I can answer your question, um, so there's two goals here that CB Fiber is, is trying to provide. Number one is is ensuring that that, that everyone has access to high speed internet, including the current you know unserved and underserved that you know live three miles down dirt roads and, and don't have access to anything. And the second goal is to provide um, quality internet. For, for all hunters in our service area. <coughs> that means every single, you know, E911 address in Waterbury. Um, now that, the initial build out includes those 209 premises uh, that are unserved or underserved. And then the, the secondary build out for Waterbury is everybody else. Now, to answer your question, how does that help them? A simple answer is competition. If, if Comcast knows that your only option to get high-speed internet is Comcast, there is zero incentive for them to offer better service uh, or lower rates. They are going to continue increasing their rates, uh, decreasing their maximum uh, uh, monthly bandwidth allotment, which they're doing across the, the country and it's just proven. And you know, CB Fiber intends on serving the people and not no. not for profit. I, I understand that. So my, I guess my question is this. Pick, pick an underserved road or an unserved road. So Mark Fryer is in the room right now. He lives up at the top of Ring Road. There's, no, there's not good service there. So you're going to build a fiber cable that goes up Ring Road. What's it going to connect to at the other end so it gets service up there? You're going to have to build you know, two miles of, of cable to or fiber to get service to his place, but what's it connecting to down below? Is it connecting to Comcast? What is it connecting to? Oh no, it's connecting to our own 100-100 uh, fiber optic cable, the ones we're installing. 
but but ultimately um, ultimately farther up the road, eventually you have to connect to the internet, right? That's your question. Where how is it connecting to the internet ultimately? And the answer for that, um, and, and by the way, anybody can read up on this if they are interested in more details uh, on our website, cvfiber.net. Um, but we recently um, we recently signed an agreement with an, and, uh, an operator, and that's Wakefield Telecom. Um, so ultimately, it's going to connect into the Wakefield Telecom uh, network, and they are ultimately providing the internet access, and we are providing the fiber connectivity um, to uh, to the, the Wakefield Telecom, um, and they we're also working with them to provide uh, any technical assistance that customers might need. So we're we're leveraging that existing network. And one of the reasons we picked that, which is all documented on our website, is they they have shown just outstanding customer service capability, um, and uh, you know far beyond any uh, any other internet provider in the area. I would like to say that uh, Christopher has stepped up to be the vice chair of the um, uh, planning and development committee for CV Fiber. So uh, right now I want to thank him for doing that. He, he is extremely knowledgeable from his experience with the committee. So well, thank you. I just want to say, I, I want to circle back. I really think we can't do anything about this because we have a budget in place. Uh, we kind of outlined where we're, we're going to be using ARPA funds. Uh, we, we don't have a town meeting, which a normal town meeting where a revision to the budget can be brought up at town meeting. That's just not available to us this year because of COVID. So I think our only choice, if we want to pursue this, is some sort of a special town, town meeting with, with, with the vote. You know, I don't think, at least between now and March 1st, this is kind of a, a, a moot issue. We can't really, I don't think, do anything like that. As a matter of fact, even if, the, even if some legislation lets a select board make a decision, I think, I personally think I would rather see a lot more transparency and the, and the voters have input on this. Just my opinion. We have until September. 2022 to put in a, a, a commitment letter. Yeah. But that means a. Assuming all the funds. Between I'm March. Assuming all the funds are taken because it is, it is first come, first serve. Yeah. That means That's between right. March and December that we would have another special town meeting to flush this, you know, have, have the voters weigh in on what they want to do. Because I'm a little bit. I, I, heard Bill's question loud and clear, and I see both sides. Chris, I think you had a good point, but people who are already served by different forms of cable, you know, what, what's in it for me? And unfortunately, we're in a society that everyone looks at things like, like that, and if there's nothing in it for them, but if Comcast or any other provider kind of looks, there's, there's a new kid in town, and that could make competition and maybe their rates are going to go down, that could be a good plus in, for CV Fiber to make a case of the, why they should come in town and why there should be some town investment. Just my opinion. Hey Chris, this is Bill Shepelak. Um, I don't know what your schedule is during the daytime, but if you have an opportunity at some point uh, during the day this week, could you give me a call here at the office? Sure, thank you. Lex. Okay, thank you. CB Fiber is uh, willing to get together with the select board and uh, pursue different uh, alternatives uh, for this process. So, um, if you folks would like more information and would like to get together to discuss it further, we would like that too. Okay. Yeah, I think I think it's it's. I'm glad you uh, came to us tonight and uh, let us know of this option. Um, it gives us the, some time to chew on it and maybe come up with some. <laughs> Uh, artistic ways of dealing with it. Uh, yeah, 
Can I say one more? Yeah, I, and I, I, I think you know, Linda and I both want to want to know that you know we're we're not trying to hold Waterbury's feet to the fire here or anything like that. Um, you know, we just and, and Linda and I, neither one of us knew about the timeline of, of the town budget or anything. Uh, we certainly would have come earlier or or tried to. Some of this information is just coming out on our side anyway. But you know, ultimately, we just ask that that you all you know make a you know maybe make a decision about you know do you do you want to you know kind of have a choice between three things find a way to amend the, the, the current approved budget uh, number two you know see if there's a, a way to use existing allocated budget or excuse me uh, unallocated money in the budget for this uh, project or you know just sort of understand like okay well we can't do that this year that might mean you know a longer timeline or or increased uh, 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 subscriber fees, but you know those are sort of you know in short those are the kind of the three uh, options. Okay. All 21 towns are in the same predicament that Waterbury is in because everybody didn't find out about this until January, toward the end of January when this Act 71 came out. So all the towns uh, are going to be in the same predicament as Waterbury. That's why we love our federal government so much. Mark, you got another? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think the, the important thing, and it's been pointed out, that this is, it might go after the underserved immediately, but the infrastructure should and hopefully will eventually be able to reach any E911 properties. That's, that's a pretty big deal. And I think that like the future of, of you know information and, and what that means, especially as like the work from home movement seems to be a continued continued thing, and I don't think that's going anywhere. That connection and, and quality connection and speed and fiber, as far as I understand, is one of the best options for that. And even Comcast isn't fiber, as far as I know, for mo most of all of Waterbury. Um, if the select board's going to consider to put money towards it should move fast because there's an option to match funds. So I would strongly suggest if the board considers, obviously it sounds like it has to be after town meeting day, but I wouldn't sit on this too long. If, if for any reason you think that the board should consider putting funds, I would move as quickly as possible to try to get the match. I would hate to see the board make a decision to do it in August and the funds are depleted. So I think, you know, I wouldn't, and I, and I would be very surprised if the of, of plenty of town people would come and, and show their support. You know, I expect a lot of people have been feeling like I have, you know, I've struggled to be connected to the internet for since I bought my house, but I know there's plenty of people on Sweet Road that are also struggling just to find the ability to connect to the internet. And, it, and I feel for the kids that are in school trying to, you know, participate in school, and like I know there's families on my road, and I don't know how they do it. I have no idea. It's a real struggle for certain properties. Well, I'm just thinking out loud here. I'm just wondering if if there's a, you know, what the bond <laughs> options are uh, for the entire amount and and amortizing it out over time. Uh, just one of the options that come to my head, as opposed to nickel and diming with this other process. Uh, Something that we need to visit uh, moving forward here fairly quickly, I think. Okay, we Linda. Would like to attend, uh, we would be the, as uh, delegates from Waterbury, we would be glad to attend and bring more expertise to a side meeting. So thank you for your time today. Okay. We hope you will decide to help the residents of Waterbury with this additional Thank you. Okay, thank you, Linda. Christopher, um, we'll certainly keep you abreast of, you know, uh, opportunities to have a discussion uh, as a joint meeting and try to get some resolution on this issue taken care of, at least, to, at least step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. All right, all right. All right, consider a grant application on behalf of Friends of Waterbury Reservoir to the State Aquatic Nuisance Program. 
Yeah, so we've already kind of budgeted for this uh, in our budget. Um, Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir have sponsored a greeter program for a number of years. Uh, it, the greeter is fully paid for by state funding. It's passed through Waterbury's budget. So the employees are employees of Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. They pay unemployment insurance, the whole way out. They pay those people uh, during the year. And then um, they report to us and say, we spent $3,200 for the greeter program, and then we turn around and requisition $3,200 from the state. They pay us, we pay the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir. Uh, this process is in place because the state money is not available directly to non for profit organizations like the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir. You have to have a municipality in between, but there's no match for us. So uh, the Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir have asked if uh, the town would apply for a grant. It has to be in by the end of this month, I believe it is. Um, asking for uh, 70, uh, for two greeters. So I think it's, it's if you ask for $7,200, that will cover it. Uh, and if, Last year we asked for 7,000, the state granted uh, 3,200 to us. So in the end, Friends of the Waterbury Reservoir asked us to reimburse them for 3,200. We got it from the state. So uh, they're, they're gonna try it for two readers again. So I would ask if you would um, make a motion to allow the town to submit an application to the state of Vermont for a state aquatic nuisance program grant uh, in the amount of $7,200. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I abstain because I'm on the board. Okay. You're on board for Friends of the Water Bar oh. Reservoir. Uh, municipal manager search process. Okay, yes, um, we, we've started to uh, the process with Bill's upcoming leaving to look at, you know, options for a potential uh, municipal manager search. And we reached out to um, Mott League of Cities and, and Towns. Uh, they, they provided us, I was actually quite surprised. Um, yeah, I expected it. You know, I've been involved in other executive searches for nonprofits and stuff, and I was expecting a lot higher cost. But they were looking at an estimated total cost between sixty-five hundred and twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty. I think it's going to be more closer to the up, upper end. And they gave us. Um, what was that amount, Mike? Excuse me. What was that amount? It was between sixty-five hundred to twelve thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars. Said it was cheap, but I, re I misread it, so I didn't know. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, I still think that's. Oh, yeah, it's price. Okay. You know, if you look at headhunters, what they search. What I was also really glad to see that uh, they use a consultant. The consultant that they're using is a former town manager of the. Um, uh, he was town manager in Williston. You know, he's, he's retired from that. I'm sure Bill probably knows him. Rick McGuire. Rick McGuire. And I like the fact that one, he's a town manager. Two, a town somewhat similar to Waterbury size, somewhat similar to our concerns. So I think he, he would understand what we, 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 would, we would look in their thing. They, they talked about our search, you know, would be definitely leaned to someone with very strong people skills, which we know that's critical, you know, in a search. You know, the other expenses, you know, they, you know, they have as advertising expenses, and they gave an, a, a schedule of different advertisers between a thousand to uh, three thousand uh, dollars. Candidate interview um, expense 
for a hundred to a thousand dollars that would include travel for someone either to fly in lodging car etc uh, a background check uh, that surprised me a little bit but um, would be between four hundred to a thousand dollars I guess they do a fairly extensive you know background check but I guess in this day and time it's probably probably more more and more important and they have some optional custom training um, in management and select board roles and responsibilities which was four hundred and fifteen dollars so you know the consultant would be the big chunk of the thing would be between five to seventy two hundred and fifty dollars uh, looking over you know I'm not going to go over every details myself and Danny uh, both were, were involved in this process we didn't wind up meeting because of different scheduling problems we didn't meet directly with Vermont League of Cities and Towns but I think it's something and I guess I could per, you know I don't know Bill should we present it to all the the numbers to all the individual select board members would just go ahead with uh, allocating money. I know we already have money allocated in, so in the budget. I mean, I tried to put some money in the budget. I think I have like 10000 in the budget. Right, so I think it was $10,000. If it ends up being a little bit more than that, that's okay. It, exactly. Uh, I think VLCT would be a good uh, entity to hire for this. They clearly know Vermont. They know us. I've been involved with the League of Cities and Towns since, mm -hmm. you know, 1982. Um, and and they, they really do have the best interests of the Vermont municipalities at heart. You need to remember, and you can share some of these costs, because I'm also the municipal manager for EFUD right now. And, right. you know, I'm, I'm resigning, retiring from that as well. So. You know, I know we've talked about moving towards maybe a merger. Uh, at best, late this year, there could be a merger vote. You're not going to be merged as an entity until after the next manager comes. So EFUD needs to play a role in, uh, in this process. Uh, there's nothing in the law or nothing you know, between EFUD and the select board that says they have to have the same municipal manager. If they wanted to hire their own person, they could. I think that would be counterproductive. So I would suggest that um, sometime soon, uh, you reach out to EFUD and have a joint meeting with them and you can share these costs because VLCT isn't going to double the costs to do, you know, right. it's, it's all, they understand that I'm a manager for both. So uh, EFUD can pick up some of those costs. I think, you know, probably on the order of a, uh, you know, a quarter 10, to a third to 20%. of that, that uh, EFUD would be about a quarter to a third of that. Um, but anyway, I, I think that's a good start. Yes. Yeah. I just think I wanted to get it on the agenda quickly because you don't realize how quickly time will, will come before, you know, we're going to have to make a decision. And the sooner, as a matter of fact, they were involved in, I think, I think they had the Norwich uh, town manager, and they're selecting them in July. So it's... Well, you know, just, just to give you a heads up, I mean, uh, uh, Steve McKenzie, the city manager, and Barry, Right. Announced before I did. He's leaving at the end of June this year. Right. Uh, last week I read in the paper that Carl Rogers, the town manager in Barry Town, is going to be retiring sometime in 2023, earliest January, but definitely before the end of the year. If he decides to, you know, that he's going to step away in January, I'm leaving in December. You know, there's there's only so many candidates to go around too. So right. I think getting a start earlier is, is better. And even if it ends up meaning that you have uh, a longer period of time where two of us are working, you know that I, I think we should start earlier. No, later. I agree. The to me is we shouldn't wait too much. We should look at things. And as you said, even if we and plus with all these other vacancies occurring, 
there's going to be competition for, for the good candidates. So that's another reason for us to get going, you know, sooner than later. So what's your pleasure? Um, I'm in favor of this. And do we have to have a joint meeting with EFOOT or can we just have an email or one of them stops by and say, hey, can we have this on your agenda for your next meeting? And if you're willing to, you know, help cover the cost for this person for this, so it just gets done yeah. sooner. When does e, e fund meet again? They meet on the second, second Wednesday. Wednesday of the month. They're meeting the day after tomorrow. Their okay. agenda is already out uh, for right. Wednesday. Uh, they could, uh, I'm sure at the beginning, they could add it if somebody wanted to come. But, right. Uh, uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, I certainly could just tell them that this process is kind of starting and that they should budget, maybe, like I said, a quarter to a quarter. Would you want me to share that email with you, uh, Bill? Yeah, you can do that. Okay. Uh, but the joint meeting, uh, uh, Katie, is not necessarily to talk about the cost. It's to get the process going. Right. Uh, you're going to want to have Rick come in, and you're going right. to talk to him, and he's going to talk to you and ask a lot of questions. And, that process. And I'd be a glad to, to attend soon. the uh, Wednesday meeting with EFUD. Okay. So if they had any questions. It's at 430. 430? Yeah. And that's it. Any any additions, Chris? Or Mark? No, I think it's a, a good first step. Uh, I don't think any of us sitting here has any idea of any other viable options, avenues. Uh, well, I know some viable some options, but they're a lot more list. expensive. What's that? I have, you know, other headhunters, which I know would be good. I think, I think this is actually better for, for the, what Bill says is, League of Cities and Towns are experiences with municipalities plus the person who they have as a consultant, who's a former, you know, who he's gonna be leading the charge. He's a former town manager, so he knows what the issues are. And I, I, I like the way that they frame in their document that they said they're really leaning on strong people skills. I think they all, you know, I, I think they were a little soft on the budgetary aspect. I think someone needs to have a good handle on numbers and stuff like that, but I think people skills are very critical in this day and time. So, Mark, anything to add? No, I, I agree. I think uh, I didn't even know about the other towns that are losing their managers, so I think yeah. you know, that, that creates an additional layer of challenge here, but I, I, I would rather see Waterbury find a candidate early, know that they have the candidate well before Bill's So I guess the next step is just on Wednesday meet with EFUD and yeah, flush, I think so. flush them out and then just go forward. I, I think I think what I would recommend is you know uh, that uh, you meet with EFUD on Wednesday, get a commitment from them to put money in the budget. You can talk, Mike, to them about scheduling. You know. I wouldn't do anything before the town meeting because right. there's going to be two new select board right. members uh, at that point. So we should wait until the new members so sign are the, on board. I would sign the engagement letter be after before, the new board. Even before you meet with with Rick or anybody else from VLCT because, you know. Uh, they should be fully invested in the board, new board. And, you know, unfortunately, EFUD, they have a different time frame. You know, they'll have. I don't know what their situation is going to be, whether uh, any of the, they, they have three positions that come up every year, just like the select board does. But their meeting isn't until May. Um, I wouldn't necessarily wait until May to start the process. I think that the select board is the kind of the driving force behind this. 
we know that if a merger happens, the select board is going to be here. So, you know, getting started early. Um, you can have conversations with them. You know, are you going to want any citizen participation? You know, are you going to look to put a couple of citizens on a search committee? Uh, you know, those are all decisions the board will, the boards will have to make. And I'm sure Rick will be able to, yeah. having been involved in processes like this, give us good recommendations. Right. So would it be too much to ask or to take a five minute executive session for something that pertains to this particular issue? Right now? Yeah. There's don't ask me. It's your, your folks. Oh, are, would you want to to make things easy? I just I have something that I think the select board needs to know about. Um, well, I'm just saying if if we do it just for convenience sake yeah. to do you're right exactly do it do it at the end yeah. is, is that going to be a problem? No, no, it won't. Is that way we don't have to connect and re yep. you know disconnect? Yep, yep that's fine. Okay. Hold up. okay. Okay, so we'll leave it open until the end. Yep, I'll add that at the end. Um, paving strategy, which I think was added because it was sitting in the parking lot. You asked me to add it. And I asked to add it because it was the last meeting that I've been participating in and it's been sitting down there for a while. <laughs> so I guess, you know, I think this original idea was surrounding paving and I know we've talk, talked at length quite a bit but understanding a strategy that we as a town take when it comes to the pavement of our roads, and I know there's technologies and there's decisions that are made during the construction process that can potentially, some we have, I think have been proven, some are questioned, but just understanding it, and maybe it's at the point where it needs to go out to someone who specializes in this, and, and maybe in a small investment in a, someone who consults on this type of work, but you know, just the question marks surrounding when you take on a, a paving project, if it's a reclaim versus a complete rebuild, the investment costs of reclaiming or whatever the, the maintenance that could occur on a road to avoid or lengthen its time, but that investment costs money too. So there's a lot of conversation and then obviously it's, you know, different roads have different impacts in terms of the amount of traffic and everything else and, and there's a lot to it but I just from being on the board for six years I still feel like it's a little bit and, and I don't think it's a problem we are a small town and maybe maybe it's okay that it's just wait until enough people are like my road's terrible and we take on their, their road but you know in terms of long term I think the one thing that we see increasing is obviously costs and paving is extremely expensive and it's a large part of our budget that maybe we should really consider digging deeper into a strategy that potentially could pay off once that strategy is in place. And obviously nothing's fixed in stone, but I just feel like maybe it, it makes sense to do something like that. And, and I, I know you guys have conversations and have some kind of Excel document that yeah, so sort of follows it. But. I, I don't disagree with you. And, and I, you know, I kind of, Spelled this out a few years ago, and for a variety of reasons, uh, Main Street reconstruction, chief among them. Um, you know, I think we do okay. Um, could we do better in terms of long-term planning? Yeah, I think. You know, I think. You know, with Chris's kind of prodding and everything else, we have ratcheted up the amount of money that we've been spending on on paving. Uh, you know, for the longest time, we were spending a couple hundred thousand dollars, and I was very frustrated and, and expressed so because the last time that Alec did a comprehensive plan, uh, this is back probably you know right after he was hired in 2005. Um, you know, he put together a plan and said, "This is what you need to do," and the select board said, "Okay, we're going to adopt this plan," and he said needs $350,000 a year, and they never funded it. It was always funded by about two-thirds, and, and that never changed. Um, you know, Alec is now uh, a part-time employee, and he's, he's uh, getting to the stage where he's becoming a more part-time employee, and soon enough is going to be not on board any longer. 
Uh, I don't know if that's going to be in 2022 when he'll finish up. He's working on some water and sewer ordinances right now for EFUD and a, and a rate structure uh, for, the, for the sewer system because the sewer system needs a little bit of money. Uh, I don't see Alec having the time to do uh, an analysis. And, you know, he's a civil engineer, but he's not necessarily a paving expert. I don't think it's a bad idea to, to talk about getting somebody in. Again, we didn't put anything in the budget this year for it, uh, unfortunately, and I don't know how much it will cost. Chris has a lot of good ideas, but I think if you really want a plan, you're, it's going to have to be a consultant. Somebody's going to have to do the whole inventory and, and come up with with a plan. And, uh, you know, I told you before that ARPA money was not eligible for surface transportation projects except up to the point that uh, lost revenue uh, could be uh, earmarked. There's changes happening to, to that now in terms of how you can calculate lost revenue, which is basically giving us a bigger opportunity to use it for our regular budgeting stuff. Um, and leaving the CD fiber out of the equation, I kind of expected that as 2022 goes along, the select board would start having meetings and public information discussions about, okay, we've got seven or $800,000, how do we want to spend it? Um, so it could be something that's done. I'm not sure we have the money to, to hire a consultant in this year's budget, Mark. Um, but, you know, I, I think that that might be the, if you really want a plan that you're going to stick to, and that's, that's where we have, I won't say failed, but we kind of are still pointing almost on a year-by-year -year basis at what's next in terms of what just seems really bad. Uh, the last couple of years, we have had a, you know, it was probably four or five years ago that Bill Woodruff and Alec came to me and said, we can use a paving grant on the lower portion of Flush Hill, which is the class two uh, portion of Flush Hill. And then shortly after that, we should do the rest of it. So we did the lower portion of Flush Hill, I don't know, three, four years ago or something like that. Now we did the upper portion last year. We're going to finish that this year. Um, Stowe Street, we kind of had, have had that plan waiting for the next paving grant, which we've got this year. But other than that, we kind of look at, okay, Stowe Street's really um, in need. And if you look at streets that are close to Stowe Street, which you know, avoids uh, more mobilization costs and stuff like that, High Street is, I mean, Hill Street is really bad, so we gotta get that. Swayze Court, North Street. So, we don't have a lot, you know, some communities have actual plans that show what's gonna happen in a five year rolling cycle. And, and to get to that point would be nice. And we just haven't had a chance to get it. Yeah, I think that's been a goal of mine since I've been on the board is to get us out of the current mess we're in with our infrastructure, at least our asphalt. I mean, the bridges are a bigger issue. Uh, it's gonna take additional funding from other places, perhaps. Uh, but if, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but we've kind of, honed in recently on a half a million dollars. That's about what we're spending on paving. And we kind of plan that out, and then if we get a good year and prices are a little better, or you know the estimate was a little high, maybe we ended up spending 380,000 out of the 500 that we had. But I think if, if a half a million dollars is what you're gonna spend, what you should really do is to talk to somebody and say, okay, We've got a half a million dollars to spend every year for the next 10 years. How should we best spend that? I mean, Mike Hedges, who used to 
you know, he was the pavement management person for the for AOT. He lives here in Waterford. And last year, he, after we finished Flush Hill, he came to me and he said, you know, every year I see that you're doing these reclaimed jobs and those are the most expensive things. And I said, yeah, I know, but those are the roads that are really in the bad shape right now. And we can't just overlay them. But I think his point was that, you know, if you can put a plan out there, you know, maybe you can get to some of these roads before you're in a position that you feel the only option is to reclaim. But I think you've kind of got the number. The, what happened before, I think, was Alec went out and did the, did the, the plan and identified, you know, these are the roads that are worse and he looked at, okay, we can do this kind of treatment on this road and this here and we should come back every seven years or what have you. He did the plan and then said it's $350,000 and the select board didn't feel we could afford that, so they underfunded the plan. If they had told Alec in advance, we have $200,000 a year to spend, do a plan to spend that, I, it would have probably been a better process. And unfortunately, uh, the assumption was they would fund the plan that he developed and, and they never did. So I think that's what you should do is to well, we did. determine I mean, your amount of money. We funded it years later. But well, yeah, <laughs> eventually, eventually, after you know, <laughs> 10 years or not. Sure. I mean, you, you remember it well a number of years ago when I put a proposal in front of the townspeople at the town meeting on a set, based on a seven year cycle the number of miles of roads that we had, the cost per mile at the time, uh, we needed uh, to, to stick to a seven year cycle, okay? Which is what the average life expectancy for an asphalt road in the state of Vermont is. It would have required 1.4 million. We were at less than 300,000. Right. 1.4 million a year. A year. Right, right, right. Every, yeah. And we uh, were spending 200000 That's what I'm saying. We were under 300000 so you can see we were falling behind exponentially. Uh, we've since come up to the half million mark. We're, we're gaining ground, but we're still not where we should be. You know, and I'm currently happy with the amount of money we're spending. I'm not kind of happy with uh, how we're spending it because we're just, you know, we're doing the same thing over and over. Um, well, I think that's part what of the concerns idea. me. What concerns me is uh, moving forward. If we're supposed to be getting out of the fossil fuel business, if we're supposed to be, you know, turning a green corner here, what's going to happen to the cost of asphalt? You know, how are we going to be expected to uh, maintain our roads if? The fossil fuel industries are going bye-bye, or who knows what's going to happen with them. Uh, so I think it's very prudent for us to try to figure out how the hell we can lengthen the life expectancy of our roads, because at some point we're going to see the cost of asphalt become probably untouchable. Uh, depending, if if you if you look at what you know what. Your, is perceived as coming, uh, and you know, it's too bad we didn't have that ARPA money back years ago. I mean, we could have put a lot of our bad, a lot of our bad roads under, utilize that foam application. I think we'd be way ahead of the game right now, but and it's still probably not too late because asphalt costs are still relatively in the same park because of the things that they've done, you know, through research and re-engineering the, the types of asphalt or what they're, they're allowing, you know, recycled asphalt to be added into the mix and several different things are going on. I'm, you know, there are solutions, there are, I mean, if we were to hire somebody, a consultant, I'd like, I'd like to be in on, involved in that because status quo I think overlooks a lot of other possibilities. Uh, sub base is a huge problem in some of our roads. 
if we started to address those issues, uh, I think it would be money better spent. Uh, but those are things. Right. And the, for and the challenge with that is, I, I think you're absolutely right. But you know, if you've got a half a million dollars and then you decide to spend three hundred thousand dollars on putting a good base under some road, that's the best thing to do in the long run. It's just you're going to have to run on a lot rougher roads for a longer period of time until you get all the way through the process. You know, and that's. That's what the challenge is, has always been, so. And that's where hopefully you can find some, the time to find someone who is knowledgeable on the new technologies, understands the cold weather climate, maybe even understands Vermont and, you know, historical sub-base or whatever that knowledge needs to be for them to give the most, you know, in-depth. But I, I agree, I think it's, if you know you're gonna spend half a million dollars, how can you spend it the most efficiently? Because boards change management changes, it's like it'd be great to know that there's some kind of strategy that best utilizes the paving funds for a long-term strategy. I bet you that pays significantly if you could if you could do it right. Obviously it takes the quality of the consultant too and, and who that would be. I wouldn't obviously use a paving company. I don't trust that they try to do the best job to not you know like good enough. I don't know if they take on that you know so it's it's an interesting scenario and you know I, I think there was even conversation about turning certain roads back into dirt and if that even makes sense I mean, I don't know. but you know having somebody help understand that challenge and help a, help a board make decisions that are half a million dollar a year decisions I think that small investment especially now if you can pull ARPA funds in that you bring the funds in by by loss of income and then you can use it for however, however you want to spend it that, that investment seems to make sense I just don't know how much that costs. But. I mean, that, that ARPA money, that, I mean, got, that was my, one of the things that ran through my head when we were talking with uh, Linda and Christopher was, you know, from an infrastructure uh, point of view, is that money better spent doing some of those things? You know, putting it towards upgrades in the road certain roads to, you know, and then use our budget to pave over them. Just use the ARPA money as the substructure. Uh, you know, it's something that we need to talk about. But uh, you're right, it's to have a plan in place. And, you know, I don't know if it ever got done. We had talked about um, keeping a timeline on newly paved roads, you know, based on whether it was a reclaim or whether it was a, uh, just a grind and repave or just a, uh, a repave, keeping some kind of a timeline on that road's so life expectancy. Back. Yeah, so you could tell. I mean, yeah. some of the roads we know full well, especially over here on Stowe Street, High Street, High Street Extension, uh, Whistle Mountain, those roads are, are horrible sub-base conditions. Uh, some of the worst in town. Uh, you know, we know immediately without having to kind of you know, keep a timeline on the on the paved jobs because right. they've I been mean, so bad in the past. And, and examples like Neyland Flats, I'm, I've been on that now for five years, and I don't. I'm just watching it and trying to understand what you know. Does a crack mean that you're you're now the road is going to start failing, and if it's not patched with tar, is that? A problem, or is that okay that the crack stays exposed? And you know, w how do you tell that a road is past the point of being able to do a grind and a, a top coat scenario? You know, and I know we have some of that knowledge in house, but it's just it's an interesting thing. And not all boards are going to be as sad as having a, someone who, who lives in that world, right? So having that knowledge that each board can pass on, I would say, would be a pretty important thing. Unfortunately, Neil and Flats is that. At that point right now, where I think a simple grind and repave is, you know, necessary, but we've got other roads and funds at this point in time, not considering any of the ARPA money, that you know need a complete repave. Right. And that, uh, that's always been the challenge: is that we have enough, we have so many bad roads that 
if you go over there and you do an overlay on Helen Platts, the people on the bad roads are all, which I wish my road was as good as the other Platts, you know? And, that, and that's what the challenge is that we have. And, and I think we all know that, but if we have this analysis done and you've got, uh, you know, a plan put in place, and this is what Mike Hedges was getting at, it's like, Spending that money to overlay this road now in the long run is going to allow you to address a lot more of your really bad roads because you'll take care of that for another seven yeah. years. And that was my goal is to right. get from a emergency, emergency management situation to a management situation and then a plan would work. Right. And we're, after we're, that. And we're getting there. I think there. we've made progress. Yeah. We've made yeah. a lot of progress, I believe. But yeah. it's a point well taken. And we can. Get that on the agenda for the, the new boardwalk. Do you want to do some research and nothing in the real near future, but who, you know, I have not a clue of where to find these kind of consultants, just yeah. kind, of, kind of get an idea of where, what the costs are, et cetera. They're, they're out there. Um, we've, we've got some of those cost estimates. And part of the challenge is that, you know, we do have Alec working for us. And he says, oh my God. Why, why would we pay somebody to do all that? We can do it. Exactly. But it's you never get it done, you know. So sometimes paying to do it, you can get the end product as opposed to, oh, we can do this ourselves and you just don't have enough time to get it. Sounds like projects around my house. <laughs> exactly. Okay, thanks. Uh, discuss February 22nd informational meeting, regular meeting date of February 21st is up. So from my perspective, I didn't think we needed to have a select board meeting to plan for the for the informational meeting. I think we've been through enough all through the month of January. You're pretty well versed in it. I certainly can speak to it. So from my perspective, uh, I think we can just meet on the 22nd and go through that information meeting. Carla has, I think, did you send up? I uh, sent it, I have copies. Okay. You wanna look over it? What time does that start again? Seven. Seven, okay. Are you good? Are we good? Yep. So we, with your approval, our plan is to hold um, the same format we did last year, which is a webinar format of Zoom. So it's just a little bit more orderly. People have to raise their hand or uh, they'll be muted and they'll, we'll use a Q&A format. Um, we just have to make sure and it will be that the meeting is accessible by telephone, by Zoom, by in person, which is what you decided at your last meeting so that everybody has the opportunity to participate. Can you remind the board and myself, how that, who were you running that? Who was kind of leading the? Meeting? Yeah, so I think, you know, the, it's set up as an agenda for a select board meeting because that's really what it is, right? Yeah. So at the beginning, you approve the agenda, there's a public, right? There's, con there might be consent there's agenda consent stuff. Agenda. Yeah. So uh, you kind of go through that, and then last year, what, we did once yeah. you got through the, uh, you know, those kind of perfunctory uh, uh, agenda items when it came to discuss whatever is next. What's the first thing on there? Um, uh, you did some introdu introductory comments and then consider the reports of the town officers because that's not on the ballot. You have the copy? Yeah. So, oh, consider the reports Number of the two. town officers. So, under that um, agenda item number two, uh, Mark, you kind of, as the chair would ask, you know, um, make whatever comments that you wanted to make uh, from the chair's position about 2021. Um, turned it over to me and I, hit the highlights in terms of summarizing the budget that was spent last year and uh, why we have fund balances and the like. 
uh, kind of set the stage for um, the discussion of this year's budget. And then the first thing on the budget is the presentation of the capital budget. Uh, you know, I can talk about the numbers and what the board has proposed to spend in 2022. The board members can chime in about things that are important to them. The public asks, and then we go right through, you know, our, our agenda item number four is the three operating funds. And again, I'll talk about that. The board can say what it wants. People can ask questions. So I think, you know, numbers, from call to order through number two, Mark, I think you're kind of the lead person on those, and then at some point you'll turn it over to me, and I'll just address the numbers and see if people have questions, and then either the board can answer or I can answer. Okay. Sounds like a weird conversation. What's happening? Yeah. Yeah. Being lengthy, through the whole day we think could be somewhat lengthy. Depends on who. It depends upon who's there. there. <laughs> well, and I think we have to also control, set some kind of expectation for discussion so things don't go too long. Have so people we can do that right at the beginning. Which is why it's nice to have. Have people the limit their comments right. to two minutes or less. On that, Carla, if we're doing the limitation, can you put it on the screen when you share your screen with the? Clock time, or is that? I think rude. Can I do what? Oh, like have like a, a timer going instead time. of having like you know how Danny does in person yeah. here, but they can't see the time going. So sometimes they talk over, and we can't get them to stop. Yeah. So just so they can see it. I think we just ask for a soft two minutes, and if it gets out of hand, we can. It's like the president the debates with the green light and red light. Yeah. <laughs> so I can do minutes. The yellow light. I mean, it's nothing, nothing more insulting than, you know, if you've got a valid point you're trying to get across and you, you know, somebody hammered. I, from what I understand, that's what the school board's like. It's like, boom, you're done. Yeah. Uh, I've been there. Just, that leaves taxpayers really. You've got to give people a little bit of a cord, but also you have to yeah, respect no, people's absolutely, time. Absolutely. It's a give and take. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions on the news? All right, uh, moving on to manager's items, Duxbury fire contract. Yeah, so we, did you bring those? So um, when I presented to you the fire contract uh, that I had sent over to Duxbury, if you remember, I told you that I uh, pointed out to them that the uh, the uh, formula by which we determined what the contract price is was uh, one of the factors in that was the Duxbury grant list and that the town of Waterbury Fire Department does not cover the whole town of Duxbury. And a couple of years ago, uh, the Duxbury Select Board, when I went over there, said, well, we don't think that we're really, whatever it was, 18% of the whole. Uh, our our uh, grand list is different than it was 10 years ago when this contract was put in place. I said, well, if it's different, you need to show us how it's different and we'll change it. So when I sent the contract over to them uh, uh, at the end of December, um, and we were gonna get like, I think it was $17,000 or something to that degree. Uh, I told them, I said, if, and I, I know I told you folks here, I said, if you can show that your uh, grand list is different, we'll, we'll do it this way. If, it's, if you're gonna get a lower price, we'll put it into effect for this year. If it's going to be to Waterbury's benefit, we'll hold off and wait until 2023. It was a way to kind of incentivize them to do it. So I didn't know at the time, uh, I should have, but Dan Sweet, who is our uh, assessor who works for us 28 hours a week, he works for Duxbury too and does that over there. So when I sent that over to, uh, to the folks in Duxbury, uh, they talked to Dan about it 
And then Carla told me that Dan uh, worked for them. So I talked to Dan and he said, why don't we get this done? So they've done it and uh, it slightly changes. So the uh, fire contract for 2022 uh, is uh, $112,070 uh, as opposed to what we had talked about before. And uh, I did. What was it before? I think it was 107, wasn't it? It was 117, I believe. What was it? Yeah. So um, I did go ahead since I got this information before the town report went to the printer. I did change it in the in our town report or in our budget. So our fund balances are a little askew from what we talked about before. But I would recommend that. Uh, you uh, make a motion to approve this contract and sign it. I, I have, um, oh sorry, go ahead. I was gonna make a motion to approve the uh, contract, uh, fire contract with uh, the town of Duxbury as presented. Is there a second? Second. And moved and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 I was just going to say I have a bunch of things you need to sign so don't run off at the end of the room. Oh, okay. Just a few liquor licenses and that um, road and bridge standards thing. Well, we still have our executive session. Yeah, I, before you go home tonight. Okay. Um, so, was there anything added to the agenda other than going into executive session? No. I don't know the verbiage there. To, uh, that someone should make a motion to go into executive session to discuss a personnel matter. So moved. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. second. Hang on one second. Yeah. Okay. You just say that you return to open session. We are exiting executive session and returning to open session. Um, I've taken no action. We've yes. taken no action. Um, if there's nothing else, I think we can take the motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, second. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thanks, everybody.